A myth is generally thought to be a traditional story that explains the beliefs or practices of a society or culture. Myths are usually passed down orally from generation to generation and may contain elements of historical fact, allegory, or symbolism. Myths, which are ultimately lies or the fruit of ignorance, surround us in every area. We hear them from everywhere and often don't even know that they are not true. Today, we will dispel some such historical myths. In his comic song, Vladimir Vysotsky explains the cause of death of the British explorer and navigator very simply. The natives supposedly wanted to eat, so they ate it. Ask anyone what happened to Captain Cook, and you will hear the answer. Devoured by cannibalistic savages, but that's not true. Here's what really happened. Cook and his crew on the ship Resolution sailed to the shores of the Hawaiian archipelago, where they had already been a year ago. The Aborigines greeted him very cordially because they were just celebrating a local fertility festival, the festival of the god Lono. By the way, the assumptions that the Hawaiians confused Cook with this very god are incorrect. Simply the rules of good manners ordered them to show hospitality on such a significant day. In general, the Europeans were received warmly. However, Cook, as British captains often did during negotiations with savages, took it and ruined everything. He needed wood for firewood and to repair the ship, and he offered the Aborigines several iron axes in exchange for totems from the cemetery, which depicted portraits of their ancestors. Cook quietly sent several sailors from the crew, and they simply stole the totems. Local residents, in retaliation, stole a rescue boat moored off the shore from the Resolution. The captain decided to return her at any cost, and for this, he took the king of the tribe hostage. At this point, the natives lost patience and went on the warpath. The king was recaptured and returned to his native village, and in the chaos, Cook was killed with a club by one of the monarch's close leaders. The Aborigines took the captain's body with them, but not for food, but to bury him with honors as a defeated leader. However, the Hawaiians then had very strange funeral customs. The bodies were buried, but only before that the bones were removed from them and covered with patterns, turning them into amulets, and then they distributed them to loved ones as souvenirs. Naturally, when the natives respectfully returned the bones of their defeated captain to the British, they did not appreciate their concerns and thought that the unfortunate man had been served to the table. However, the Hawaiian Islanders are not into cannibalism and prefer fish. They weren't trying to make cook their dinner. If you ask the average person why the Inquisitors burned Giordano Bruno, he will most likely answer, because he refused to believe that the Earth is flat, and when asked who proved that it is still round, the confident reply will follow, Columbus. However, both of these beliefs are wrong. Giordano was persecuted not for his theories about a round Earth, but for his heretical reasoning. In the same way, Columbus did not set off on a voyage to prove to anyone that we live on a balloon. Another thing is that he greatly underestimated the size of our globe, believing that it was 3,100 miles to sail from Spain to Japan. In fact, it turned out that the sail needed to be about 12,400 miles. In addition, the navigator never expected that he would stumble upon not India, but a couple of new continents. Actually, until the end of his life, Christopher believed that the lands he discovered were simply Indian shores. It is because of this confusion that Native Americans are called Indians. The myth that the main mission of the traveler was to prove the sphericity of the Earth appeared because of the book The History of the Life and Travels of Christopher Columbus by Washington Irving. He is, for a second, an artistic author, not a historian, and he simply invented the dispute between the navigator and religious fanatics regarding the shape of the world. The sphericity of the Earth was experimentally established by the ancient scientist Eratosthenes in the 3rd century BC, and for scientists of the late Middle Ages, there was nothing innovative in this idea. A popular story from World War II says that the Poles fought German tanks in a very original manner. They rode on tanks with spears and swords at the ready and chopped in close combat. Obviously, this story is meant to illustrate either their incredible bravery and dedication or their equally incredible stupidity. In reality, this is a fiction. The Poles knew very well what tanks were and why fighting them hand to hand was pointless. The story is German propaganda and it was invented to ridicule their opponents. In the Battle of Krojanti on September 1, 1939, which served as the basis for the story about hand-to-hand -hand combat with tanks, the Pomeranian Lancers actually rode horses. The horse is a fairly maneuverable creature, which was also used in World War II, but they were armed not only with swords, but also with anti-tank guns and rifles, and these things stopped tanks quite well. True, in the end the Polish cavalry was defeated. There is a legend that Napoleon was short, 
This is exactly the image that can often be found in cartoons of that time. And the famous Napoleonic complex is also named after the French emperor. In reality, Napoleon was not at all a little corporal, as the soldiers called him, but had above average height. Where this myth came from is not known for certain. According to one version, the nickname Little Corporal was given to Napoleon by his soldiers. Moreover, Napoleon never held this sergeant rank, but began his service with the rank of junior lieutenant. But during his first military campaigns, the future emperor liked to dress in the uniform of a corporal of the old guard. According to another version, Napoleon was often depicted in paintings surrounded by his associates, and they were significantly taller than him. The caricatures of the British artist James Gilray also played a role in the formation of the myth of Napoleon's short stature. On them, Napoleon is drawn very small and with a disproportionately large saber. For example, in the engraving The King of Brobdingnag and Gulliver, King George III holds Napoleon in his palm and looks at the Frenchman through his lorgnette. There is also the so-called Napoleonic complex. This is the name given to a set of psychological traits supposedly characteristic of short people. This term was coined by the Austrian psychologist Alfred Adler when he was developing his concept of an individual theory of personality. As an example, he cited the ancient Greek orator Demosthenes, who suffered from a speech impediment since childhood, as well as famous generals who were short. But in fact, Napoleon's real height was 5 feet and 2 inches, that is 168.7 centimeters. This was established based on the results of the autopsy of the former emperor which was carried out by his personal physician after his death in 1821. For France at that time, such growth was considered above average. Vikings began to be depicted in horned helmets around the 19th century. Such helmets appeared in the paintings of some Scandinavian artists when they depicted scenes from mythology. For example, such works were written by the Swede August Malmström. However, the image was not universally accepted. It only became popular in the 1870s, when Richard Wagner staged his famous opera tetralogy, The Ring of the Nibelung. The costumes for this opera were designed and designed by costume designer Carl Emil Doppler. Apparently, he was inspired by the work of Malmström, because in his sketches, the Vikings appeared with gold-plated horned helmets. It was they, according to historians, who became the reason why the image of a Viking in a horned helmet gained such popularity. Roberta Frank, a professor at Yale University, has devoted an entire study to the question of why horned helmets became the generally accepted version of what the Vikings looked like. According to her, the helmets that Doppler depicted are the result of a mixture of historical facts and imagination. As Frank explains, the Germans were then fascinated by the myths about the Scandinavian Vikings. This allowed the German peoples to create their own national idea, which had independent roots. At the same time, the motive of searching for a national idea in German culture was one of the central ones in the 19th century. Therefore, Frank believes that the stereotypical horned helmets, sometimes worn by German knights in the Middle Ages, ended up on Viking heads because German and Scandinavian legends were intertwined. There is actually no evidence that the Vikings wore horned helmets. Moreover, archaeologists have found very few Viking helmets, more or less intact, only two, as well as several more fragments. None of them had horns, and it has not yet been proven whether these were combat helmets or ritual ones. It's hard to say whether Vikings wore helmets in battle or whether it was a sign of status, explains Professor Andrew Jennings, a Scottish Viking expert at the University of the Highlands and Islands. Therefore, it is possible that the Vikings did not wear helmets at all in battles, but it is clear that there is no reason to believe in horned helmets among the Vikings. 